Welcome to Mrs. V's Reading Corner, where you can enjoy books for educational, fun, or even bedtime stories. Please take the time to like this video, comment below with how you enjoyed it, book suggestions, and more. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel to get all the new books that I post first. The Unsinkable Wreck of the RMS Titanic from Ghost Liners Exploring the World's Greatest Lost Ships by Robert D. Bollard and Rich Archbold. Inside the cramped submarine, all I could hear was the steady pinging of the sonar and the regular breathing of the pilot and engineer. I crouched on my knees, my eyes glued to the tiny viewpoint. The pings sped up. That meant the wreck was close. And I strained to see beyond the small cone of light that pierced the endless underwater night. Come right! I was so excited I was almost shouting. Even though the two others with me inside Avon were so close I could touch them. Bingo! Like a ghost from the ancient past. The bow of the Royal Mail Steamer Titanic. The greatest shipwreck of all time. Materialized out my viewpoint. After years of guessing... I had arrived at the ship's last resting place. Effortlessly, we rose up the side of the famous bow. Now, weeping great tears of rust, past the huge anchor and up over the rail. We were the first in more than 70 years to walk on the Titanic's deck. The giant windlasses used for rising and luring the anchor still trail their massive links of chain as if ready to lure away I felt as though I had walked into a dream in 1912 the Titanic had set sail on her maiden voyage the largest most luxurious ship the world had ever seen on board were many of the rich and famous of the day. Then, on the fifth night, tragic. An iceberg seen too late. Too few lifeboats, pandemonium, and over 1,500 dead out of more than 2,200 people on board. Now, the sub sailed over the well deck, following the angle of the falling foremost up toward the linear bridge. We paused at the crow's nest. On the fateful night, lookout Frederick Fleet had been on duty here. It was he who warned the bridge. Iceberg right ahead! Fleet was one of the lucky ones. He made it into a lifeboat and to safety. The pilot set Avon gently down on the bridge, not far from the telemotor control. All that remained of the steering mechanism of the ship. It was here that First Officer William Murdoch, desperate to avoid the mountain of ice that lay in the Titanic's path. Shout it to Hellsman, hard as starboard. Then Murdoch watched in excruciating agony as the huge ship slowly began to turn. But it was too late and the iceberg fatally grazed the liner's side. I thought of Captain E.J. Smith rushing from his cabin to be told the terrible news. Thirty minutes later, after learning how quickly water was pouring into the ship, he knew that the unsinkable Titanic was doomed. 
We lifted off from the bridge and headed toward the stern. Over the doorway, we could make out the brass plate with the words, first class entrance. In my mind's eyes, I could see the deck surging with passengers as the crew tried to keep order during the loading of the lifeboats. The broken arm of a lifeboat davit hung over the side. From this spot port side, lifeboat number two was launched, barely half full. Among the 25 people in a lifeboat designed to carry more than 40 were many coots and her two boys. Willie and Neville, they were among the relatively few third class passengers to survive the sinking. As our tiny submarine continued toward the stern, we peered through the windows of first class staterooms. The glass dome over the first class grand staircase was long gone, providing a perfect opening for exploring the interior of the ship. But that will have to wait for a later visit, when we would bring along a robotic swimming eyeball, Jason Jr. As we continued back, I wondered what we would find. We already knew the ship lie in two pieces, with the stern nearly 2,000 feet away. Suddenly, the smooth steel subdecking contorted into a tangle of twisted metal where the stern had ripped free. Beyond it, hundreds of objects that had spilled out when the ship broke in two were lying on the ocean floor. As we floated out over this debris field, I found it hard to believe that only a thin film of sediment covered plates and bottles that had lain on the bottom for 74 years. One of the ship's boilers sat up right on the mud with a tin cup resting on it, as if set there by a human hand. Champagne bottles lay with their Quirks still intact, a porcelain doll's head stared at us from its final resting place in a soft ooze. Had it belonged to little Laureen Allison, the only child from the first class who didn't survive that night? Most haunting of all were the shoes and boots. Many of them lay in pairs where bodies had been fallen. Within a few weeks of the sinking, the corpse had been consumed by underwater creatures and their bones had been dissolved by the cold salt water. Only those shoes remained, mute reminders of the human cost of the Titanic tragedy. After only two hours at the bottom, it was time for Alvin to begin the long ascent back to the surface ship, two and a half miles above. As we headed back to the surface, I was already impatient to return to the Titanic. We had only begun to plumb its secrets. The End <laughs>